uh, that about that that um, you said uh, feed the future of use. Uh, they are extremely user-friendly. If you haven't seen them, I advise you to go to AgriLinks and take a look at what they have on offer. I assure you uh, it will help you in all of your work. Uh, I think um, for DAI, uh, we are uh, very involved in economic growth and agriculture, and those tools have, have, have really been helpful. Um, particularly, what we'll be talking about today, which is uh, the um, awe gender-based violence um, in agriculture toolkit. Uh, this is an extremely user-friendly document that I think teams will really um, appreciate taking advantage of and will really help improve your work uh, in um, agriculture and GBV. Um, I think those of us who might not be in the gender space uh, might struggle to understand the link between GBV and agriculture. And uh, Jen and Liz will talk to us a bit about that today, um, talking about their toolkit. And one of the collaborations that uh, DAI has been fortunate enough to have uh, with the ALT program, um, and that it was uh, our uh, I am project in Uganda is integrated agriculture markets uh, in Uganda. Um, we were able to collaborate with um, the all program as a pilot uh, project with that toolkit. So they'll be talking a bit about that today and about the toolkit in general. Um, they'll be explaining that link that isn't clear to everyone about uh, the link between uh, GBV and um, our work in agriculture. So I will hand it over to, uh, to them and they will uh, continue and they'll introduce our um, IM team as well. Hand it over to you, Jenna. Yes, thank you so much, Leslie, for that kind introduction. We're very excited uh, that DAI is, is hosting this event today. Um, we're delighted for yet another wonderful collaboration with DAI. Um, the uh, AWE program, uh, as, as Leslie mentioned, is, is very excited about the, uh, the toolkit that uh, we're sharing today. And, and also um, very happy to be able to, to host this discussion on, on gender-based violence in agriculture and market systems programming as part of uh, our support for the 16 days of activism uh, against gender-based violence. This is such an important topic. Um, but I'd like to introduce uh, for, for people who may be uh, perhaps new to the AWE project, um, the Advancing Women's Empowerment Project. Uh, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, please. Um, we've been around for a few years, um, but for people who aren't familiar, uh, the Advancing Women's Empowerment Project is a Feed the Future funded activity um, with the objective of advancing women's empowerment and gender equality in agriculture systems and programming through design and learning services, implementation support, and, and best practice capture. Um, it was produced, our work is produced under a BPA that works with the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. Uh, and uh, we provide a range of technical assistance to missions, implementing partners, RFS, and USAID offices with a goal of increasing women's participation, productivity, profit, and benefit in agriculture systems. And we do take an inclusive lens in this approach by thinking about not just women, but also youth and other uh, traditionally excluded groups, uh, because it really is important to think about uh, gender equality, women's empowerment in inclusive ways. Next slide, please. So this is just a little bit of an overview of the type of work we do and how we do it. Um, so we do provide design and learning services for missions. We provide support for implementing partners. Um, and we also do a lot of uh, capturing, translating, and disseminating evidence of practices that uh, promote improved outcomes. Uh, and this is how the, the GBV toolkit was developed, um, which uh, our, my colleague Liz is going to speak to uh, later in this, this session. So we're very excited to come to you today. Uh, and next slide, please. 
today's session, uh, we're, we're in the welcoming portion, um, but we're going to start out talking a little bit about where and how GBV is relevant to agriculture and market systems development programs. Uh, we may have a lot of people with us today who um, are working either in gender or agriculture culture market systems or both, um, but it's important to talk about this issue, particularly as for many years, um, people didn't see the connections between GBV and agriculture and market systems. And now we're actually um, excited to see how people are really paying attention to it and seeing this as a priority. Uh, so we're here today to further that, that discussion. Liz is then going to uh, share an overview of, of the GBV and Agriculture Toolkit, which is an exciting resource uh, that, uh, as, as Leslie mentioned, our goal is to make it very user friendly, um, particularly to programs um, that, that may not have uh, initially thought about GBV. Um, but whether you're uh, in, in the design phase or the implementation phase, we know that there'll be relevant uh, elements in it for you. Um, and then we're very excited uh, to have a fireside chat, uh, which will be moderated by Leslie, uh, with uh, some of the people who were really instrumental in piloting the toolkit with the Uganda IAM project, uh, who will talk about their experience. So I'm really delighted uh, that they'll be joining us today. And of course, that will be followed by opportunities for you to ask questions and, and participate in the conversation. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned today, you're going to be hearing from me. Uh, I am the uh, Advancing Women's Empowerment Gendered Agriculture Systems Advisor. And when, uh, in addition to that role, I'm the Vice President of Gender and Social Inclusion at ACDI VOCA, where I lead a team of gender, youth, and social inclusion advisors implementing uh, and, and supporting our organizational policies, strategies, guidelines, resources, uh, supporting our, our projects and proposals uh, to ensure that we're promoting promoting gender equality and social inclusion. Um, we'll also hear from Liz Hohenberger, who is a, a gender specialist for AWE um, and, and program lead as well. She's the gender, in, uh, excuse me, gender integration specialist with Encompass, where she provides technical and operational leadership on gender and agriculture programming. Next slide, please. You'll also be hearing from Leslie Gonzalez, uh, who is uh, the with DAI, and she's an international development professional with nearly 20 years of experience uh, designing, implementing, managing, and evaluating gender, youth, and stabilization programs across Africa, Asia, the Middle East, South America, and Eastern Europe. And she's the lead specialist for JESI in the EG sector at DAI. We'll also hear from Annette, uh, who all worked very closely with. Um, uh, to pilot the toolkit. She's a gender, youth, and social inclusion advisor at the Feed the Future funded in Inclusive Agricultural Markets Activity in Uganda. And she leads the program JESI efforts by catalyzing inclusive growth to place women, youth, and other marginalized groups at the heart of the business models. And she helped lead uh, the uh, piloting of the GBV toolkit for IAM. We'll also hear from Kristen Pfeiffer, who is the DCOP of IAM. She leads the design and implementation of complex agriculture market systems and investment facilitation projects, and she specializes in development approaches that facilitate behavior change through market actors, including farmer groups, processors, traders, exporters, agro input suppliers, and service providers, as well as financial institutions, business support, and advisory services firms. So we've got quite a lineup for you today, and we're very excited to have you with us. So let's get started. Next slide, please. Uh, today, as I mentioned, we're gonna start out talking about where and how GBV is relevant to agriculture and, and market systems development. So to get us on the same page, uh, let's talk about first, what we mean by GBV. Next slide, please. Gender-based violence, just as a definition, is an umbrella term for any harmful threat or act directed at an individual or group based on the actual or perceived biological sex, gender identity and or expression, sexual orientation, or lack of adherence to varying social constructed norms around masculinity and femininity. I'd like to note that there are different types of gender-based violence. So it, it oftentimes is, is associated with 
what we call intimate partner violence, um, which is uh, within a relationship. Um, but there are many forms of gender-based violence that need to be considered and addressed. And so we can mean uh, physical violence, emotional and psychological violence, sexual violence, economic violence, as well as sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment. And these are forms of violence that can occur within the home, between partners, um, but also between family members, uh, between people that are, are not necessarily known to each other. It can happen in many locations and spaces outside of the home, in communities, in workplaces. Uh, and, and so it's very important to consider a range of types of gender-based violence. Uh, and so that's one of the things that we're seeking to raise awareness of as part of our work around considering this in uh, agriculture and market systems development. GBV also includes early enforced marriage. Um, I do want to note that, uh, that that is an important form of violence that is also relevant to agriculture and market systems development. It is not thoroughly addressed in the GBV toolkit uh, because of the, the, the strong uh, group of resources uh, available to address child enforced marriage and because of the need to focus the resources that we, we do address in the toolkit. So I do wanna note that that is an important form of GBV, um, but we do focus the GBV toolkit specifically on the forms of violence I previously mentioned. Um, if there are questions about types of violence, I am happy to address that uh, in the Q&A. Um, I would like to, to move to a little bit of a participatory activity. So please join me on Menti for, for a few minutes. Um, please go to menti.com and enter that code, or you can access uh, through the links or the QR code on the screen. So, um, and, and they're also put in the chat. So we'll give you a minute and then uh, Cheyenne is gonna take us over to the Menti where I'm gonna ask you some questions. All right, Cheyenne, you ready to take us over? Okay, now these questions, uh, first we're gonna, we're gonna test people's uh, or check in with people's awareness on uh, some of the ways in which GBV is relevant to this sector. All right, I already see some answers to the first slide. So in broader terms, uh, please, please provide your answer. Uh, Gender-based violence is estimated to cost countries, some countries, up to what percentage of GDP? Is it 2%, 4%, 8%, or 16%? Okay. All right, so the correct answer at this point in time is actually 2%, but I do see that we have quite a few uh, responses that are on the higher end of that scale. Now I will, I will recognize that these, this data is, is a little bit on the older side. And we honestly don't know um, what current estimates are, especially with the impacts of COVID. COVID has significantly impacted countries' uh, uh, economic uh, uh, output. And, and gender-based violence was a major uh, uh, impact of COVID or a, a major, uh, uh, COVID had a significant impact on causing rising rates of GBV is what I wanna say. So we really need to, to uh, update the, these numbers, but it's very difficult to track this information. Um, but you may be surprised that, uh, that GBV is, 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 that is only at 2%, but we suspect the number is higher. It does have a significant cost. And even thinking about what 2% of GDP means is actually quite high. So, uh, so, so I can see that people do know and, and can recognize that there is a significant cost. Turning to a bit more of the micro level, let's go to the next one. All right. In a study of uh, female horticultural workers in Ethiopia, 
uh, how many out of 10 do you think reported that they personally experienced some form of sexual harassment while working on the farm? Three out of 10, five out of 10, seven out of 10, or nine out of 10? Give people a few more minutes or another minute. Okay. The correct answer is nine out of 10. So I can, I know that that can seem hard to believe. Uh, and it makes complete sense uh, that we see a range of responses. But yes, nine out of 10. So the, the experience of sexual harassment of, of female horticultural workers at Ethiopia was extremely high. So this gives you a sense of not only how, how high and how common it can be for female horticultural workers to experience this, um, but think about what the potential impacts of this common form of violence could be in this sector. And if it's happening here, what do we need to look for and learn about elsewhere? Next slide. Okay. So on a more positive note, a company in Sri Lanka called Sol Tuna implemented an anti-harassment policy uh, a, a couple of years ago. When they did so, they saw an estimated uh, what number increase in annual revenue because of increased productivity. 234,000, 580,000, 1.02 million or 1.58 million. I can see the answers are coming in. Nobody's picking 234,000. Good. We're leaning towards the bigger impacts. Yeah, you're right. Believe it or not, the results are actually above a million. It was 1.58 million which actually is extremely notable and shows just how much a difference it, it made for this company in instituting an anti-harassment policy and presumably uh, reducing harassment uh, in their organization. So there are not only significant costs to addressing gender-based violence, but significant benefits, or not costs to addressing it, but costs to having gender-based violence, but significant benefits to addressing it. So one more slide in the mentee. So here, uh, what are some examples that you can think of uh, thinking about the projects that you support or uh, projects that you've worked with and, and examples that you've come across? What are some other economic costs uh, that you can think of of gender-based violence in agriculture or market systems projects? Does anyone have any examples? Fewer women joining the workforce out of fear? Yes, that can certainly be a cost. It could be fewer women, the fear could come from being fearful of what's happening in the workplace itself or fear of the consequences within their homes or their communities. That's a great example. Low nutrition outcomes, absolutely. That can come from 
the lower uh, lower uh, income they're bringing in, and then a number of different longer term or or more complex impacts. Low, loss of business and competitiveness, absolutely illness and workman's compensation, depression. Certainly there, there can be both physical and mental health impacts that have economic costs. Costs for the health care of survivors and absentee, absolutely. Increased productivity gaps based on gender for lack of motivation, absolutely. I see um, reduction in labor and raw materials uh, due to unproductivity at certain points, absolutely. Lower productivity at the farm level, limitation on food and health services for children. Yes, these are all important examples. Great, thank you so much. Let's return to the PowerPoint. So I'm sure we could spend more time coming up with examples, but those are really wonderful examples and a great start to help us think about why we need to address gender-based violence, <laughs> excuse me, from multiple uh, perspectives and ways to start thinking about, oh, we got a little bit ahead, or did we? I think I got ahead. Nope, <laughs> we did not. That is correct. Uh, go ahead. Um, certain ways we need to think about. So why does it matter among the uh, economic costs? There, there as, as you've noted, gender-based violence undermines performance, participation, and benefit from project activities. So when we are trying to achieve certain objectives, uh, we know that it can, it can certainly impact all of those things. It can directly undermine the goals we're trying to achieve, not just from a gender, youth, and social inclusion perspective, but also those exact economic goals. It affects employment, productivity, income generation, market strengthening. Um, so it can be a uh, perhaps hidden cause of, of undermining those goals and it's something that we want to surface. It can also be an unintended consequence where we have really good intentions and we're, we're doing things that increase income, for example, but, uh, but without paying attention to the risks and the potential dynamics uh, and uh, what happens when income increases for, for, uh, for certain groups we could un uh, unexpectedly or unintentionally cause negative outcomes that include increases in violence. Um, the other thing to consider is our own staff. Um, when, when staff encounter gender-based violence disclosures or incidents, um, if they're not prepared and, and don't know how to handle it and don't have processes or procedures, um, there can be interpersonal and professional challenges. So we wanna make sure that staff and projects are fully prepared for the context in which they're operating. Next slide, please. So uh, Liz is going to go over this in a bit more detail. This is a this is an example from the GBV toolkit. But one of the things we want to emphasize is that this is a, a relevant issue, uh, not only in the household. Oftentimes when we are talking about gender-based violence, people often think about this as, as a household issue. But we really want people to expand their thinking and note not only that violence can occur in workplaces and workspaces of many different types, um, but there's a role that supporting institutions play. Violence can occur there, but it can also be perpetuated or, or those institutions have a role to prevent gender-based violence. Uh, they're part of the enabling environment and can also trigger GBV. And there's relationships between these levels of a market system. So it's very important to think about the connections between uh, these levels of an agriculture and market system and how, how there are not only risks, but also a ways in which uh, you can provide support in mitigating gender-based violence at these levels. Uh, so, so this is something that we would encourage uh, GBV, pro, or excuse me, agriculture and market systems programs to think about where GBV can be relevant and where mitigation measures can be taken. Next slide. So just as a quick example, uh, and I know this is a lot of reading material, so uh, the PowerPoint will be shared. Um, but one example you'll find in the GBV toolkit is uh, there's different ways in which to think about GBV and how it's relevant. In this case, uh, a Kenyan food processor um, uh, was was sourcing chili from smallholder farmers and, and looking at the ways in which men and women were producing this chili, they both had a role to play, um, but they noticed that they were having decreasing supplies and investigated. And it turned out 
that, uh, that while both women and men had a role in production, it was men who were uh, being paid for that work and retaining that, that money. And this is an example of economic violence, uh, where men were retaining the money, were spending the money, uh, and women simply uh, were, didn't see the value in, uh, in doing the work to, to receive no benefit. Um, so there was a need for Mace Foods, the, the Kenyan uh, processor, to address this issue. Now, what they did was they, they developed a solution that worked for them in that context was to find different ways to provide payment that were accessible to both the men and the women. So, for example, providing direct cash payment to both men and women and providing non-cash payments that included things like distributing uh, sugar, uh, which was a desirable household com commodity. Um, as well as, uh, you know, ensuring that women receive the cash directly. So this is a way to think about uh, at the higher level or at the beyond production level of the value chain. Uh, next slide, please. Another way to think about it is where work is happening. And as you saw in the, the Ethiopian horticulture example, where uh, men and women are doing their work can also be a place to really think about the risks of gender-based violence. And, uh, and in a program implemented uh, in Bangladesh by DAI, um, they noticed that, that harassment uh, or in, a, in the market was a risk for women and it, it, it negatively impacted women's opportunities. So they identified a solution to create safe spaces for women, um, identifying a, a opportunity for women to have separate safer vegetable markets. Creating segregated spaces is, is one option. Uh, there are other options uh, to consider. It's So there's not a one size fits all approach. Uh, it's about understanding the risks and opportunities and the context. Um, ACDI VOCA has, has also identified these risks and done things like worked with male champions uh, and, and created safe spaces or safe safety measures within markets so that women had, uh, had safer access and, and, and were able to operate safely in markets in, in Kenya. So, uh, so there are different ways to approach it, but it's really important to look at the spaces in which uh, women and men, uh, you know, both elder and, and youth and, and people of, of different types of social identities are conducting their work in order to identify what the risks are and what the potential solutions are. So with that, because I'm sure you're wondering, well, how do I do that? I'm going to turn it over to Liz, who can talk about the toolkit and how it can support you in that process. Thank you, Jen. So now we're going to take some time to do a quick tour of the toolkit. Our producers will share a link to the toolkit in the chat. So if you'd like, please open it up on your screens and follow along as we walk through it. Next slide, please. So we developed the toolkit through a multi-stage process. We conducted key informant interviews with GBB public and private implementers to get their feedback on the tools they used or developed themselves, as well as 11 key informant interviews with USAID mission staff. We held three focus groups with the agriculture implementing partners, internal and external validation meetings within our team and with USAID. In the fall of 2020, AHA held a technical advisory group workshop with 12 implement, implementing partners where we collected feedback that informed the first draft of the toolkit. And as I've mentioned, AHA conducted pilot testing, testing of the draft toolkit with the USAID Feed the Future Uganda IM activity. Pilot testing took place over a nine month period and we'll talk a little bit more about how that worked out during our fireside chats. As Jen mentioned, this toolkit intends to provide practical guidance for agriculture and MSD technical staff and gender and social inclusion advisors. It specifically focuses on GBV and day-to-day -day programming in order to one, make it easier to identify how and where GBV shows up within the context of agriculture and market system development programming, and two, to support project staff to think through lo logical entry points to integrate GBV prevention, mitigation, and response into ongoing project activities. Next slide, please. The toolkit is organized to walk the reader through the process of first identifying GBV where it may show up in their work, and second, determining how, when, and where to address it, and third, implementing concrete steps and tools in their day-to-day -day activities. In part one, the toolkit begins with an overview of how GBV typically shows up in agriculture. We developed this graphic to help make GBV visible within the different levels of the agriculture market system. 
So this is the graphic that Jen has already shared. I'm going to walk you through it a little bit more so you can kind of understand all these different levels of where it shows up within the agriculture market system. So in the graphic, we can see a broad pattern of gender-based violence. At the household level, violence most often occurs between spouses as intimate partner violence or between family members as domestic violence. It's important to note that household GBV can be economic, such as limiting access to finances, as well as mobility and information. It also includes the use of emotional, physical, and sexual violence, or the threat of this violence. Non-intimate partner violence, sexual violence, including sexual harassment, exploitation, and abuse also occurs in multiple workplaces and levels across agriculture and market systems. This violence is pervasive, occurring in fields, pack houses, processing centers, trade routes, markets, factories, and other such sites, and ranges from harassment to threats to actual incidents of sexual violence and sexual abuse and exploitation. Levels are often interlinked. Women's increased access to benefits and resources from participating in agricultural workspaces and supporting institutions can challenge power, power relations and intimate partnerships, affecting the household level and could possibly trigger gender-based violence and harassment from the broader community. Part one of the toolkit then explores core principles for integrating gender-based violence prevention, mitigation, and response into projects. I've highlighted some of these on the slide, including using a do no harm approach, ethical guidelines for gathering GBV data, identifying actions to address GBV that are feasible within the bounds of a project scope and budget, working with local partners and respecting the local culture and context while avoiding perpetuating existing harmful norms and making sure to engage men and boys in challenging patriarchal norms. You can read in more detail about these principles in the document. The toolkit then outlines two pathways that projects may consider when addressing GBV. Keep in mind that projects often have a budget and human resource limitation, especially when they're halfway through implementing a project. project. The toolkit then proposes that pathway one, where projects are able to integrate GBV actions into their existing activities, Pathway two, where they can have resources to develop interventions outside, the, outside of or going beyond routine agriculture and MSD interventions. And then you'll see these two icons throughout part one indicating information that follows each pathway. So you do have two pathways with which you can exist and integrate um, GBV prevention mitigation response that the toolkit will help you follow through. Next slide, please. The toolkit then outlines potential actions that can be implemented within a project's activities at the household, workplace, supporting institutions, and enabling environment levels. I've included snapshots here to show you what it looks like, but I encourage you to read through the section in the toolkit itself. For example, to assess and mitigate risks of sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment, projects can carry out safety mapping of the physical areas and times when women and other at-risk individuals are more vulnerable often in isolated places, distant, field, distant fields, solo interactions with managers, or in crowded places where there's little accountability, such as during transport or in markets. Projects have the opportunity to shift activities and other plans to mitigate these risks and ultimately restructure physical workspaces to mitigate GBV risks. Projects that may have additional resources to develop new interventions could work with government agencies to assess transport infrastructure and provide improvements that would further mitigate or prevent these risks, such as by ensuring adequate outdoor lighting of walkways above and below ground for more frequent bus stops. After part one has been helped, has helped to make GBV and potential actions to address GBV visible in the context of agriculture and MSD projects, Part two of the toolkit walks the reader through how, step-by-step, -step, ag and MSD projects can integrate addressing GBV into different components of the project life cycle. It's important to note that the toolkit intends to support projects that are, design or that are at design or implement stages so that midstream projects can address GBV even if it was not originally part of their project design or annual work plans. Here especially, the toolkit links to worksheets and its annexes, which I'll discuss a little bit more at a later stage. For example, in the strategic planning design phase, the toolkit provides guidance on how projects can identify GBV risks within their activities by examining value chain nodes, market functions and dynamics, and other project elements that may have intersecting GBV risks. In the final chapter, the toolkit also includes how-to resources 
for responding to disclosures from survivors, as well as related tip sheets for talking with survivors and guidance for how to develop referral resources. Our consultations in developing the toolkit highlighted that many ag and MSD project and partner staff are working in communities and hear disclosure of GBV, yet are of often unprepared for how to respond. This guidance, which draws upon humanitarian resources, really seeks to address this gap in providing support to frontline staff as well as to survivors. I also want to quickly highlight a few supporting components of the toolkit. The document starts with a user's guide to indicate the different chapters or sections that might be most useful based on your role within a project. You'll also see a number of boxes throughout the toolkit that are color coded, indicating tips when using or implementing the toolkit case studies or project examples indicated by seeing it in action boxes, and lessons learned specifically from pilot testing. And I also want to spotlight our annexes, which include the following list of resources and worksheets. We've created individual Word versions of these worksheets that you can download and either adapt to your project's context or so that it's easier to complete them. You can find these worksheets on our toolkit resources page, which our producers will link again in the chat. Now I'm going to hand over to Leslie, who will be facilitating our fireside chat with Annette and Kirsten from the Uganda IAM program. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. And let's see, do we have uh, Annette and Kirsten on with us now? Hey, Leslie. Hi there, Kirsten. And you have Annette as well? Annette, are you there? Hello. Hi, Hi Annette. Annette. How are you? Good, All good right. things. How are you? Good. There, now I see you. I just wanted to make sure. So yeah, thank you, uh, Jen and Liz, for that uh, introduction to the toolkit. That was great. And I, I really do suggest that everyone have a look at that. It, it really is um, it really is a great tool uh, that I think you will enjoy using. Um, Annette, I wonder if you can tell us a bit about how the tool was introduced to the team um, and how it was received by the team. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, early in 20, early 20, 2021, 2021, yes, uh, Feed the Future Advancing Women Empowerment reached out to us and, uh, and shared with us about the details of a toolkit that was had been was being developed and we were a perfect match because we are an agricultural led activity and we are also an msd a market systems development activity so when they introduced this to us we already had we already had pre pre predetermined activities around gbv because during our early assessments our earlier market assessments we had realized that gbv was one of the key constraints that was limiting the participation of women in, in agricultural market systems. So when they reached out to us, we already had thought through plans of actually engaging a consultant and working with other government structures and every other structure that we could tap into to see that we address the issues of GBV within the market systems, but ensuring that the survivors that are part of our beneficiaries in the activities are also accessing the services. So when they reached out to us, we realized that we had gotten an opportunity and we're a perfect match for this. So when they introduced this to us, of course, we at that point in time, we only had one GSC specialist and that was me. Um, so that would mean that this would be really overwhelming work for just one individual. So the most important thing that the Advancing Women Empowerment team did was to conduct an introductory session with the entire team, the entire technical team, and share with us about the benefits of this toolkit and how much it will it will uh, it will support us in achieving the the ultimate goal of of, uh, of improving the livelihoods of of the farmers of the smallholder farmers that we we look at at the end of our goal. So, when we had this introductory session, it was so relatable with some of the work that was what that we're doing. And even when we looked at the different uh, key worksheets within the toolkit, we saw that these were very, very helpful in terms of mapping out the different incidences of GBV within our work. But most importantly of all, something that most of the uh, economic growth activities overlook is um, 
unintended consequences, as Jen rightly put it at the beginning, the unintended consequences of our interventions. Sometimes we have very high targets, like our activity, we are targeting 60% of the beneficiaries to be women. And if we do not really look out for issues that may limit them or what or what our activities may, may lead to predisposing them to violence, then we cannot achieve the 60% participation. So what we did was to see to, to also map out the, the the risks that our activities may cause in the event that we do not put in different prevention preventative measures of ensuring that there is no GBV, GBV in, the, in the work that we are doing. So this toolkit really came in handy, but also as staff, we have staff that interact with the community and also we have the private sector that interacts with the community so often. So this toolkit also has, has the sections of survivor toolkit where in the event that you're in the field and you're interacting with some of the beneficiaries or the farmers or other market actors that are, are survivors what exactly you can do to remain ethical and professional in the work that you do but also ensuring that you can link some of these people to some of the existing services that are that are within the community so back to how the team received it is uh, we were tr we, we 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 held the trainings together with feed with the feed the future advancing women empowerment and these were the introductory section and then later we did a deep dive and through that there was a lot of familiarity with the with the worksheets that exist within this toolkit so during the work planning we did a facilitative approach of ensuring that we use these tools to 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 map out uh, incidences of GBV that may occur within activities and how we can be able to respond to them. And also, this also helped us to plan further because we can't only look at the stuff or feed the future inclusive agricultural markets, but we also have to think about the stuff of the private sector that we engage because we are a, a market facilitator. So we may not necessarily be dealing directly with the grassroots beneficiaries of, of our activities so we we came up with a group uh, a group of champions and uh, these champions after the trainings had happened this was uh, we gave an opportunity for staff to self-select themselves it wasn't something that was forced but then we realized that many of the team members have acknowledged that there is gbv within their works within their work line and for them to be better market systems advisors specialists or managers they need to also be equipped with the skills on how to handle this so we 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 called out for staff to 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 come out as champions and many of them did and as i speak now we have a team of 11 champions both technical and operation staff and these are very very passionate about issues of gbv within the market systems space so through these champions we've been able to roll it out and cascade it to the lower level and those are the we go to the private sector and then definitely we've actually gone to the level of working with agents and training them and also interesting these agents to be part of the championing cause so we have champions at private sector level but we have also gone ahead because we know that beyond the private sector which are maybe agribusinesses and agri SMEs and member-based organizations like cooperatives. We also have other other groups like village savings and loans associations. We have groups like farmer groups, but we know that within these groups, there are also risks that may happen. And in if we do not have a champion at that level, for someone to come to a champion that is at our level, it may take them a longer time. So we we also instituted that at the grassroots level, and we are seeing many people come through. And then also, we, we also didn't end at that. One of the biggest challenges with economic growth activities is uh, we do not report. The reporting arm of, of responding to GBV does not happen. And this also affects how people receive services. So we have worked with the government of Uganda and roll out, rolled out the national incident reporting tool and uh, we are seeing that some of our farmers who are experiencing this are being reported. And for us, we, all we do is we are not a healthcare service provider or any 
of those other response lines, but we make sure that we link them to the rightful service providers to, ex to, ex uh, to access the rightful services so that they can meaningfully participate in the markets. But most important of all is for us to create a, a, a preventative measure of creating awareness, creating campaigns. As I speak now, early next year, we are starting a campaign. We've come up with a behavior change and communications campaign that also touches the issue of gender-based violence and uh, through that, we are going to also ensure that we create awareness nationally within using the, the economic growth lens, using the market systems lens to show and to show the world that there is there is a lot of violence that can happen within the economic spaces. And this is how we can go about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Annette. And uh, Kirsten, I wonder if you can talk to us a bit about um, how how the project uh how the activity is able to uh make the case for including uh gbv in your work um particularly when there isn't an objective that uh, captures or a component that is a gbv related component how um how was that case made and how how is that received both by the clients and by um the team itself and your private sector partners Hey, Leslie. Uh, sorry, it's six o'clock and I just realized I'm still wearing my uh, apron. <laughs> um, but it really hasn't been a hard sell. Um, I think our activity was meant to be an MSC activity with a very strong focus on inclusion and uh, for us to try it out and do it bit by bit. Um, I don't think we jumped in full force the first year. We kind of piloted it with a few partners, saw if there was interest, and the fact that some of the private sector partners we worked with were interested and wanted to be GBV champions for us um, was really helpful because we could show that it wasn't just us coming in as an outsider who wants to do this, but there was demand amongst the agribusinesses that we worked with. Um, and then there was also demand amongst our staff, as Annette was talking about. And so instead of just adding this onto a net scope of work, which was already fully burdened, the fact that we were able to bring everyone on at like a 10% level of effort commitment from senior management really allowed us to build the capacity across about a third of our technical team, and then also bring in non-technical team members who had an interest. And so um, I think this year, this quarter, we really scaled up a bit um during the 16 days of gbv activism and i can talk about that a bit more but it was gradual it wasn't like we came in and decided this is what we're going to dedicate a quarter of our work to um but we were able to gradually try it out see where the interest was um, learn from our partners and what they wanted to do um and you know take it from there and, and so i think annette has some more recent experience um, with other development partners getting involved um, and wanting to learn with FTFIM, but also some of our private sector partners who really see this as important for their, you know, agricultural agents and farmer groups and employees. Thank you, Kirsten. Yeah, and can you can you talk to us about that? And maybe you can also talk a bit about um, some of the uh, prevailing social norms um, that might um, sometimes can make it challenging to implement work like this, both on teams and um, vis-a-vis -vis the um, population. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Leslie. Um, I think like Jane earlier put it, we sometimes we look at uh, gender-based violence as a social vice, and we don't know that this also affects the economic the economic part of our lives, right from the household all the way to the national level. So in most cases, it becomes a hard sell in the economic system or in the economic sector. However, when you relatively show the costs like we did earlier in the exercise that we went through with Jen, then that really is a very huge eye opener for anyone in the private sector. If you show that there is the violence, GBV is affecting the profitability of this particular company, and also, if you show the statistics of this is how GBV is causing absenteeism for this particular ag agri SME, then that already rings a bell. But uh, like you said, social norms are, are so much enshrined within 
the GBV is enshrined within the social norms of most of the regions of our country, and I think globally. So some things have passed on as normal and it happens, but especially when it comes to economic growth, economic growth is one of those is one of those uh, tough tough parts of GBVs, tough types of GBV that we can try to come to to show. But once you show the economic costs of why if this exists, then there are challenges. Then you you get to understand that okay now this is how we are going to bring it to a farmer who thinks that my wife. I'll give an example. Most of the communities in Uganda, weeding of any kind of crop, whether cash crop or it's a food crop is an activity done by the women and in most cases cash crop farms are owned exclusively by men for food crops it's usually both men and women because usually issues of food security are handled by the women so one 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 of the districts where we work this man continuously forces his wife his wife to go and weed his um, his coffee farm and when the wife reaches the coffee farm, she, she, she remembers that at the end of the harvest period, I do not benefit from this coffee. So to her, she feels, well, I'm doing this because culture says I'm supposed to weed the coffee. So what did this woman do? She did it for quite a number of seasons. And one time, she, I think she was so fed up, she reached the farm and cut down all the stems of coffee. So what did this mean? The entire household had lost a livelihood. She, she the, the man had lost his coffee. The farm that, uh, the company that they link with for aggregation also loses a number of volumes that were, that were being provided by this household. And ultimately the economy of Uganda is also affected. So some of these social norms, we keep insisting that they should be there. So when, uh, when this affected the household, I mean, when, when the trees were cut down, of course, this woman experiencing another layer of GBV. At first, she was being forced into an economic activity that she was not interested in because she knows at the end of the day, she doesn't benefit. But like I put all layers at the, at the end of the day, at the national level, we all lose as a country. So you start from the household, then you move to, to, to the producer organizations or, or bulking centers, all the way to the, to the exporters. And at the end of the day, the, the GDP of a country can be affected just because of that. And if you look out for similar groups, similar households that are experiencing the same, you realize that there are so many losses. So that's the reason as to why for us, as Feed the Future Inclusive Agriculture Markets, we've We've looked out for ways of addressing social norms from a private sector lens to show them that this, this is how much this social norm can lead to losses in terms of, uh, of, of a livelihood or even in terms of separation of, of couples because of some of the challenges that they may face if we, assist, if we, if we insist on some of the social norms that may not facilitate the, the work that, is, that, is, that the household is doing for agriculture and also for 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 market systems thank you thank you annette thank you for that response a little more exciting than we bargained for um but thanks for that um so uh, in terms of your um the uh, private sector partners um with uh with i am has this been um when you're working with them has it been something that is is new to them to think about? Have they questioned uh, the, the rationale behind it? Um, I know oftentimes we hear that GBV is a private matter. Why would you bring it into the private sector? Uh, how has that been received? And if I can ask a follow on to that, just because I'm assuming that many of your private sector partners, many are men, um, so maybe you can talk to us a bit about mm -hmm. um, your male engagement, uh, which was one of uh, one of the topics that uh, Liz and Jen had mentioned um, as a, one of the principles and, and priorities of yeah. the um, uh, approach. Yes. So some. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, when you look at the private sector, some of them were already some of them some of those that we work with are already converted. They have already looked out for some of the losses that come as a result of gender-based violence or even on a whole 
generally not including women within their activities. So for those, it was easier to just share materials and they feel like they have a new guiding tool that can help them now be more structured in their response. Then others, it was new. And from our side, like, uh, because we had already integrated this within our interventions. And uh, at the beginning of every, every partnership, we do a gender, a gender equality, youth and social inclusion um, scorecard or assessment. So we try to co-design together. And then when we are looking at the business model for this particular partner, we try to, to highlight some of the areas where we'll see these risks at the beginning of, of the intervention. And then we try to highlight to them and then we work together to to, to de-risk some of those constraints that may lead to, to limitation of, of achieving their goals. So for most of them, we begin at the point of co-design where we try to identify them and then dedicate sometimes resources to ensure that we address some of these causes and also the drivers towards this. And, uh, and then there are others that they did not anticipate that this would happen. So along the way, we work together so that I, I remember one of the presenters shared the, the different pathways where we design at the beginning and then there's a pathway, the second pathway where we integrate within the already existing projects. So there are those that do not anticipate that they would experience some kinds of, of, uh, of, of some kinds of challenges of GBV. So within, when they, they, when they realize that there's GBV within their work or some of the work that they're doing there are some risks that are coming up and then we we work together with them to either create awareness and do any other prevention activities to ensure that we address a lot of them have seen because we have tried to show the economic the economic challenges that they may face in the event that they don't they do not take gbv serious within their work so they've already appreciated many of them have and uh, as they work they try as much as possible to see that everywhere where gbv may affect their profitability they quickly act upon it we have a part a partner in one of the regions in the country and that partner i think for them they were seeing a lot of challenges, especially for their female workforce, the workers in a, at the factory. It's an ag a grain trade company, so there's a lot of aggregation and sorting and quality management. And so they realized that sometimes their, 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 their female workers do not come to work. So to them, they try to ensure that they engage the spouses of these women who are working in quality management to, and also ensure that there is transparency because sometimes the GBV that happens at economic level where they, dis, they they deny them to participate in economic activities is because sometimes there is lack of transparency between the couple. So they bring about this kind of awareness creation and bring these couples as champions and this has helped a lot that they see more women coming and there is limited absenteeism with no reason and also abandoning their work without without any other challenges that is beyond GBV. So through engagement of their spouses to, 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 the, to, to, to ensure that they are in agreement with their wives coming to work and also sorting out issues around childcare responsibilities, seeing that they also participate at household level to, to ensure that the unpaid care work that would limit this woman to come into the economic spaces is addressed, then they are able to come. So those male champions are the ones now who speak a lot. These male champions are the ones now who come out to speak more to, to some of how they've seen changes in, in their work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Annette. Um, so we have a question uh, or comment here from Patrice, um, who is also working on um, a market systems project uh, in, in uh, he's in Haiti. So he says, I'm a bit uncomfortable on the emphasis of tying GBV to economic growth. I wonder, is that really a transformative approach, leaving aside the philosophical human right approach that is the potential 
being shortchanged through tying GBV with economic growth. Not really a question, but it's a it's a it's a reasonable. Um, it's a reasonable comment. I think uh, those of us who uh, work on GBV or who have uh, uh, who have worked in the past on GBV from a human rights based approach, this this can be a, a, a jarring one. Um, uh, Liz or Jen, do you want to to maybe uh, comment on um, Patrice's comment because I do think it's an important one and it it is one that comes up. Um, working in this space from, from the uh, economic growth perspective? So I'm not exactly sure what Patrice means by tying GBV, tying GBV to economic growth, but what I will say is perhaps what's needed is more clarification to say that gender-based violence exists everywhere in every context where all of our programs operate, including economic growth programs. So the purpose of what we're doing today and the purpose of having this discussion is not to say that we're tying gender-based violence to economic growth, but that economic growth programs need to acknowledge the realities of gender-based violence. So this is really important to understand that economic growth programs simply cannot afford from either a rights perspective or even uh, an economic perspective to ignore the realities of gender-based violence. Essentially, this happens in every community, uh, in every geographic region. And it's really important to know that programs should understand the context and look at where the risks are and how it can be appropriately mitigated. So, um, so it's really not a question just of doing no harm 